Okay, now it's time to introduce the last of the basic quantifier rules, existential elimination. Just like we did with universal elimination, let's motivate our discussion of this rule with an apparent problem for a rule system. Here's an argument that's definitely valid, and so its conclusion ought to be derivable from the premise. It says, there is an F, that's G. Therefore, there's an F. An English instance of this would be, there is something that is both round and blue. Therefore, there is something that is round. Definitely valid. It looks like we should get our conclusion by applying ampersand elimination on our premise. But here's where we hit our first snag. Ampersand elimination can't be directly applied to there is an X, FX, and GX, because the ampersand is not its main operator. We have to somehow get rid of the quantifier, so that we have access to a sentence whose main connective is the ampersand. So, suppose that we simply write a substitution instance of the premise. Now, the main connective in 2 is the ampersand. We can detach FA and then get our conclusion by existential introduction. But wait, this seems too good to be true. Is the step from 1 to 2 valid? Well, in fact, there are excellent grounds to be suspicious of our move. Inferring 2 from 1, as we just did, is just as bad as arguing like this. Someone is sleeping, therefore Al is sleeping. If the only information that we have is what is provided by our premise, namely that someone or other is sleeping, and if there is more than one domain member, then we have no justification at all for concluding that it is Al who is sleeping. The conclusion would have been equally true if Ad had been awake and the sleeper had instead been Beth or Claire or Dimitri. Hence, this inference is bad, and for the same reason, our move on line 2 is bad as well. Well, what if we use no names, but use variables instead? As we'll see, that is a step in the right direction. Sadly though, it won't work, because the resulting sentence is open, and in this system, open sentences are not allowed to roam free in a derivation. So that's not our solution either. But what if we do this? Suppose that f is x is fun and g is x has googly eyes. We begin with the premise that some person is both fun and has googly eyes. Now, we don't know the name of that person or persons, but to make things easier on us, to allow us to apply our rules and techniques, let's call that person Al. The only thing we're going to assume about Al is that Al is fun and has googly eyes. In fact, the name Al could be seen as short for someone in this domain that is both fun and has googly eyes. And this isn't much different from what journalists did with the name Jack the Ripper in late 19th century England. When they used the name Jack the Ripper, they weren't referring to a specific individual they had in mind. Rather, Jack the Ripper designates whoever was responsible for the murders of at least six women in Whitechapel, East London, between August and November 1888. In the end, our strategy for exploiting existential quantifiers is going to be a bit indirect. It's going to involve opening a subderivation and then starting the subderivation with an assumption in which we replace the variables in the quantifier with isolated occurrences of a name. What does it mean for a name to be isolated? It basically means that it can't occur outside the subderivation. And why should the name be isolated? Well, since we just mentioned Jack the Ripper, and this got us in a funny mood, let me try to motivate this requirement with a murder story. A murder mystery. Inspector Cluzo and his team from the police department are trying to solve a murder. They have a tiny database with three suspects and what is known about them. They have John Smith, who is an asthmatic butcher, Mary Axelrod, who is a university professor who suffers from a bad case of dandruff, and Nick Graves, a lyrical poet who is prone to hiccup attacks. Then, in a different place, there's also an entry for what is known about the murder. And given the bizarre and gruesome nature of the killing, they conclude that the murderer must be a dangerous psychopath. After the investigation has dragged on for some time, team members are getting tired of saying the phrase, the person of a non-gender occupation or health condition who put the victim's life to an end in a most gruesome, bizarre manner. Then Clouseau, as the leader he is, steps up with a suggestion. He said, let's shorten things up by using a nickname. Let's say John. Uh, John Smith, a nondescript name in the style of John Doe. After which, they go on vacation, even though there's a dangerous killer on the loose. 
But now we have two entries with the heading of John Smith. And suppose that, in the team's absence, a well-intended but nosy intern, it's always an intern, decides to merge both databases, so that all the information is in one place. Now the entry for the suspect John Smith, an actual person's name, not a nickname for an unknown individual, says butcher, asthmatic, and dangerous psychopath. When the team comes back from vacation, they hire a fancy criminal profiler, who takes a look at the database and concludes that this John Smith character, what with being a dangerous psychopath and all that, it was looking pretty murdery. So they decide to focus their investigation on John Smith, which turned out to be a dead end, a waste of taxpayers' money, and what's worse, deadly for several more victims, since Professor Axelrod, the real culprit, was free and undisturbed, spilling blood and covering everything with dandruff. And all because of a reasoning error caused by a bad naming choice. So a lesson from this is that they shouldn't choose as a nickname a name that was already in use in their database. So a name like, say, Sam Smith would be okay. However, suppose that they forget that this is merely a nickname. Then, when they finally catch the murderer, instead of calling them Mary Axelrod, they still refer to them as Sam Smith, even when they are in a press conference. Then, people read a huge headline saying, the gruesome murder was committed by Sam Smith. The problem is that the public already associate the name Sam Smith with a famous singer, who is now, as a result of the policeman slip, wrongly considered a murderer, and this cost them their artistic career. After this mishap, and with hindsight, the team concludes the nickname for the murderer shouldn't be used after the investigation is concluded. So we have two lessons. First, the nickname for the unknown criminal shouldn't be already in use. And second, the nickname shouldn't be used after the investigation is closed. It shouldn't be used to announce the results of the investigation to the outside world. So the name should be put in quarantine, if you will, and kept within the confines of the criminal investigation. In other words, the investigator's use of the nickname should be isolated. So if we replace criminal investigation with subderivation for existential elimination and nickname with individual constant or name introduced in the subderivation, then we have an intuitive idea of the reason why the names we introduce in our subderivation must be isolated. Here's an illustration. Suppose that we have these premises. In premise 2, we have not FA. On line 3, we start a subderivation with A used as a name. However, notice that A is already in use. And given this mistake, we are led to infer a contradiction in line 5, namely that Al is both fun and not fun. However, there is no such contradiction in the premises. And the conjunction rule is perfectly valid. So the mistake must be due to the confusion that we caused by having chosen a name that was already in use in the derivation. Now that we have an intuitive grasp on this requirement, let's give a definition for isolated occurrences of a name in a subderivation. A name S is isolated in a subderivation if and only if it does not occur outside of that subderivation. So whenever we exploit an existential sentence, we open a subderivation. And to the left of the assumption, we write the provisional name that we are using for whomever it is that makes the existential sentence true. In this example, the name is A. So it's perfectly okay for A to occur within the subderivation, provided that it doesn't happen outside of it. Okay, now finally, let's give the official statement for the existential elimination rule. Suppose an existential sentence appears in a subderivation, as does a subderivation with an assumption involving the name S, which is a substitution instance of the existential sentence, replacing the variable U with the name S. Also, suppose that the name S is isolated in this subderivation. Then, if X is any of the subderivation's conclusions, in which S does not occur, then you are licensed to draw X as a further conclusion in the outer subderivation. In the form of a diagram, here you have on line 1 the existential sentence you are going to exploit. Then you start a subderivation with a substitution instance of 1 as an assumption, and with the name S. Then, on the force of this assumption and further valid logical operations, you end up with conclusion X. At which point, you close the subderivation and copy the last line onto the next one, now in the outer derivation. 
The justification is existential elimination. And the lines you cite are those that include the sentence, the existential sentence you exploited, and uh, those lines comprised by the subderivation. So remember, S cannot occur in any premise or prior assumption governing the subderivation. S cannot occur in the existential sentence we are exploiting. S cannot occur in X. As to why your special name can't occur in the conclusion of the subderivation, the reason is that you will export that conclusion out of the subderivation and onto the outer derivation. Here's an illustration of why. Suppose that you start this subderivation and your purpose is to exploit the existential in one. Everything is okay up to line four. But then on line five, you decide to generalize on the second occurrence of A only so that your special name occurs in the conclusion. Then you close your subderivation and end up illegitimately concluding something about something or someone called A, who wasn't even in the premise to begin with. But then this argument is bad for the same reason why someone sleeping, therefore Alice sleeping is bad. They're both invalid. Hence the isolation requirement on the name we are introducing. Okay, here are some examples of the application of the rule. Show that this argument is valid. So max is F. Therefore, so max is F or G. We start with our first premise and leave the intended conclusion in a corner as a reminder. Now, to exploit the existential in one, we start a subderivation. And since no names are in use so far, there is no obstacle to our using the name A. Then we use V introduction on line 3 to get FA or GA. And then, by existential introduction, we obtain a sentence that is identical to the one that's our target conclusion. But we're not done yet. We have to close our subderivation. And that's what we do in the following line, where we copy the subderivation's conclusion onto the next line, and credit the step to existential elimination, lines 1 and 2 through 4. Notice that your line citation has two components. The first one is the line of the existential you're exploiting, which in this case is 1, and the other one is the subderivation, which here it takes lines 2 through 4. Okay, here's another example. Show that this argument is valid. Here are the premises. I arrange for a derivation. And our envisioned conclusion is P. Remember that sentence letters are also admitted in predicate logic as atomic sentences. You can think of them as predicates with zero places. I didn't write P down because it's easy to remember. Notice that the only place where P occurs is in line 1, where it is the consequent of a conditional, which is itself within the scope of an existential quantifier. So we're going to need to do two things. Get rid of the existential and find a sentence that matches the antecedent of the conditional, so as to detach P. The matching sentence will surely come from the universal on line 2, but let's start by exploiting the existential. Whenever you have the choice between exploiting an existential and exploiting a universal, you should start with the existential. This policy will minimize the number of names you have to work with. Okay, we choose A as a name, and we write as assumption the A for X substitution instance of the existential in 1. Then we exploit the universal in 2. We'll use the same name that's already in circulation. Then we detach P by conditional elimination. That's the conclusion we wanted to get, so we close our subderivation. And write P on line 6 by existential exploitation, likes 1 and 3 through 5. Now consider this argument. Premises, intend a conclusion. We'll start by exploiting the existential in 1. But that requires a subderivation and a name. Which name should we use? Should we use A again? No, A is already being used. So it wouldn't be isolated. However, B is fine, so that's our choice. Here's our assumption. We eliminated the quantifier and replace all the occurrences of the variable X with the name B. So we are left in 3 with a sentence that uses two names, B with F and A with G. Looking ahead to our conclusion, we need to get a conjunction where the same name satisfies both F and G. Now we have two names available. Is the name that we're going to generalize on so as to get our conclusion, well, is that name going to be A or B? Since the only way to get H is by exploiting an instance of the universal in 2, where such instance will be a conditional, and since that conditional has an F in the antecedent, and since B already occurs with F, 
the conjunction we're going to build is FB and HB. So we get FB. Then we obtain if FB then GB from the universal in 2. And then we detach HB. Now we can form the conjunction. And we existentially generalize on the name B. Finally, we close our subderivation, take our conclusion to the outside, and then cite the appropriate lines. Okay, that's all for today. Remember to practice this a lot. Bye.